I'm, I'm very sorry that Aviva weren't in that um, financial well-being providers slide that was that was up there before. What what an omission! But but anyway, delighted to be here today. So I'm going to be talking to Karen, and what we wanted to do was kind of just frame a little bit around what financial well-being really is and what the impact is for employers and employees and also to do a bit of a soft launch of Aviva's 2024 Working Lives Report. So we've done these for the last three years. We actually did one back in 2017 as well. But we go around, we do research with over 1,000 um, employees and 200 employers and ask people questions about how they're feeling about work, how they're feeling about their finances. And we've got some quite rich information. So. Um, the report is available for you to download today. We're not fully launching it yet because of the general election, but it is available as a soft launch. And also I'll be quoting a few stats from it as we go through. But we really wanted just to kick off and get your views as an audience. So we've got a poll question for you. So Anna, if we could have our poll question up there which is really asking you what you think financial well-being is. And you can see that there's various options in there. Uh, having a good relationship with money looks, looks doing well at the moment. Understanding your finances, very interesting. We sit, no one's really gone for the amount of wealth that a person has. It's quite good. Or having enough money to get by. So understanding your finances currently in the lead. Relationships still doing pretty well. We'll give you a little bit more time just to make sure that we get a decent answer. But that's, that's great. So we've got three, three answers that are popular and a couple that aren't. When we put this together, you know, we didn't think there's any wrong answers per se with it. So we're really interested to get people's views. And I'm fascinated to see those top two there as well. And at Aviva, we would probably say that it's having a good relationship with money. But I think the understanding your finances was also come in as well. And why we've tended to focus on the relationship is that it can be quite easy to think that someone who's got a lot of money is not going to have any financial concerns. But that is not the case. So it's how do you feel about the amount of money that you've got that is really, really important. But being able to understand what you've got, I can absolutely see why that's up there as the top answer. Karen, I don't know what your views are on that from you know, your own experience at Moody's or what you hear some of your employees saying. Yeah, I think um, you know, absolutely there's no wrong answers on that page, um, but, but absolutely having a good relationship is key and what you touched on already in terms of, you know, there can be a perception that financial well-being is an issue for lower paid employees only when, you know, it's absolutely across the board, you know, different, different salary levels, different sectors, everybody is impacted just in, in different ways. And, and financial well-being can go much more broadly into sort of more mental well-being. I think there's, there's quite a startling statistic in, in Aviva's report around the number of people who have had to unexpectedly dip into savings that were planned for something else. And, and that up then leads to uncertainty, anxiety, anxiety. Um, about having used that money that was that was intended for other means, which impacts people's mental well-being, which impacts their ability to bring their whole selves to work and actually focus on what we need them to be doing. So it's it's such an important topic. Absolutely, yes. The, the sixty-four percent had savings which they were emergency savings in their own mind, but they'd have had to tap into you know, over time just because of the cost of living crisis. And as you say, that's a really startlingly high figure. And then what are the key financial wellbeing trends and challenges that you're seeing at, at Moody's? And what have you been doing about these, Karen? Yeah, I mean, clearly cost of living, um, cost of living crisis is impacting everybody. That's something that we're hearing about from our employees on a, on a regular basis. We're getting lots of asks from people to really see where we can focus on tax efficiency, you know, more salary sacrifice benefits, those, those types of things to really help employees make their money go further, essentially. Um, and I think it's really 
adding to the challenge of engaging people, particularly younger age groups, with thinking about things like saving for retirement because ultimately, you know, they're focused right now on the here and now, the cost of living, how are they going to afford to save for that house deposit when all of their costs are going up all of the time. Um, it, it just makes those conversations much more difficult to really get them to, to look ahead at some of the topics that we know are important and we want them to focus on. Exactly. And I think the report really showed that, you know, the cost of living crisis is by no means over. So, you know, we've got in here 73% said the cost of living crisis has made them feel more anxious about their finances. So back to that, you know, how do you feel about money again? And over half of the employers that we talked to in the survey think that their employees are worried about financial well-being. And it's quite interesting, almost two thirds of employees said that their employers don't provide enough tailored support which would help improve their financial well-being and I think that links quite well back to Jeanette's section as well talking about you know how do you get more tailored information out to your employees and that probably fits more in that financial guidance and, and coaching area that she was talking about and then just thinking Karen, as, as the workforce continues to evolve and you know it gets broader, more diverse, different ages, different sort of neuro capability. You know, are there other areas that you're focusing on where you think, you know, people have got more well-being needs perhaps in that area? Yeah, I mean, at Moody's, we're definitely focusing on the neurodiversity piece a lot. We've recently, well, in the end of last year, launched a neuro neurodiversity support network to really try to have a forum to be able to, to support people and, and bring in some of these, these topics. So that's a, a key focus area for us um, this year. And I know something that Aviva also has um, quite a focus on. Absolutely. And it did come through in the report. And this is probably something that we've seen a little bit more in this year's report than we have in others. But, you know, 43 percent of employers have increased the support they provide for their neurodivergent employees over the past three years. And 65 percent of employers, 61 percent of employees have agreed that there's actually more awareness needed in supporting those needs of neurodivergent employees. And certainly some of the things that, that I've seen you know, in terms of new apps that are coming to market, you know, there's a little bit more focus on how we can make things clearer, more rules based almost for some of those neurodivergent employees, because that's what they're looking for. So I think there's a lot more that probably can be done there. I also Absolutely. feel that we might all benefit from it. You know, making it simpler has got to be a good thing. Absolutely. And, and also recognising that one size doesn't fit all. You know, we need to be, to be flexible in the, in the approach. And then thinking perhaps about the different ages across the workforce. So do, do you have kind of, you know, tailored support for the younger folk as they're joining Moody's? older people as they're getting closer to retirement. How does that work for you? Yeah, so certainly we we focus on particular age groups in terms of, for example, over 50s and, and really trying to make sure that people are really engaging. Um, you know, I was quite shocked recently reviewing some of the statistics through um, Aviva Workplace to find that we had, you know, a few people literally, you know, in their late 50s, a sort of age group who who hadn't engaged with the platform, hadn't even recently, you know, looked at the funds that were in their, in their pension pot um, and so that, you know that's a real concern in terms of making sure that we engage with them that we give them access to some of the Aviva webinars for example to, to really support you know when it comes to younger employees um, you know it's kind of a a different approach that's needed and I was actually talking to my daughter last night she's 20 she's just back from university she's sick of mum talking about pensions and, and things like that um, but I said to her you know if, if you were just you know in your job and, and you know that I've talked to you about the importance of putting money in early and the growth you know but but what would you really need to engage you with this and and what she said to me was I want to see real examples don't just tell me that um, you know it's better to put money in early that, that you know, don't just tell me about the effect of um, um, benefit of salary sacrifice, benefit of employer contributions. Give me some real examples, demonstrate to me the numbers that will actually make me go, oh, goodness, this is something. Because, you know, again, coming back to that cost of living crisis, 
it's not a focus for for you know youngsters in terms of you know particularly when they're just starting out in their career they're probably paying off student loans they're probably trying to save for a house however much you tell them this is a good thing you've got to really find ways to visualize it and and get that message home um, and yeah. I do think it's hard when it's so far away for, for younger employees. Absolutely. And also, you know, with changing political environments, I think there's a mistrust there in terms of you're telling me that this is now, but, you know, what might change in the future? Do I really want to be putting money away that I can't potentially touch, you know, till I'm 55, 57, 60, whatever it may end up being as, as they get older? And we did pick up in the research that it was actually younger people who were feeling more anxious about their finances through the cost of living crisis. So 69% of, six, of 16 to 24 year olds, 79% of 25 to 34 year olds said that the cost of living crisis has made them feel more anxious about their finances. I'm not sure they're necessarily then in the frame of mind for the discussion about the long term when the short term is so scary. Yeah, absolutely. My daughter does have a pension, but that's because I put her into a pension when she was six because I thought, no, I've got, I've got to do this. You know, mummy works in pensions. And so she obviously didn't want a pension, but she has one. <laughs> so so let, let's go to the, the, other, the other end of the scale, the older workers. And so, so they're getting towards retirement. You're offering them some webinars. You know, is there any other support you're offering in the workplace? You're know, linking back to Jeanette's talk, you know financial advice is that available you know would you think about it you know how, how do you feel about that kind of support I think financial advice is is important but it also comes at a cost which you know in the current environment for employers is challenging to find extra budgets um, we've we've focused more on you know the real engagement piece pointing people in the right direction you know letting them know this is an important topic and where they can find financial advice rather than necessarily funding it on a one-to-one -one basis uh, at this point um, and really just seeing how we we can use different forums to to raise the topic and raise awareness so for example we have a number of business resource groups uh, at Moody's one of them is called our generation resource group and so the, you know, that tends to to be a really good way to to get in front of the the right people to to really you know explain to them that this is something that they they need to be thinking about because it is amazing how even as as people get closer to retirement they they're kind of still in denial to a point and you know and, and need to really have some support in in thinking about this as a as a topic and certainly one of the trends that we saw in the Working Lives report was employers were actually more concerned about trying to retain their older workers in the workforce. So, you know, over three quarters of employers said it was really important for them to retain their over 50s employees. And you know, most of those actually rated it as very important. And then we've looked at some of the things that some of the employers do. And, you know, it, it is quite interesting. You know, they were even talking about apprenticeships which I think is great, you know, because you think of that for young people, but actually, you know, retraining, getting people thinking about doing something different in the later part of your career. And that might not be easy for, for someone like Moody's to do, Karen, but I don't know what you thought about that as, as a concept. Yeah, and, and again, I think it comes back to one size doesn't fit all. You know, we've, we've got situations where you're going to want to, to try to retain people for longer. You've got other situations where, you know, perhaps that isn't the case because through, through sort of, you know, your, your um, you know, natural turnover rates, that's part of how you, you manage your work force um, but I think it's about really wanting to support people to be able to make the choices for themselves and not to be in a position where they feel they're going to be forced to work for longer because they haven't really had that guidance information advice whichever you know piece it falls into early enough to to really plan and and you know put themselves in the position that they want to be in because ultimately you know retirement means something different for all of us um, but it's it's just so important that that you know we encourage people to to actually think about what that looks like for them absolutely and in the survey there was a number of employees who said that they actually wanted to work for longer and they wanted the the companionship the sociability of it but there was also a significant amount who said they had to yeah. because they didn't have the money and we do see a lot of people trying to kind of get by till the state pension kicks in because that's sort of receding ever into the distance <laughs> and you've got to kind of live from that gap from when you stop getting a salary to when that state pension kicks in and that becomes just more important for some yeah 
And then I suppose my final question for you is, what would you like to see more from? You know, how can providers, service people in the market, you know, financial wellbeing providers help you as an employer to do more for your employees? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a number of areas here. I think one of them is tech and really, um, you know, providers really developing robust, effective tools that can be personalised for people to be able to, to really model out what, what sort of, you know, future outcomes might look like. And, you know, there's a number of modelling tools out there, but perhaps not all of them are as tailored or as, as personalizable as, as we would like to see. Um, but also, you know, cost effectiveness. That's like I mentioned before, it's not always you know, accessible for employers to have the budget to be able to really fund that one-on-one -on -one advice, which is maybe you know, the ideal situation that, that we would like to be in. So how can you know, providers really work to provide those, um, those cost effective solutions and to be more creative at the end of the day, given the challenges that we've that we've just talked about if we're not going to you know we need to accept that we're not always going to be able to persuade um, our younger workforce to to be able to, to or to, to choose to prioritize putting money towards a pension for example so maybe we can change the narrative a little bit and focus it at least on saving and saving for the future and retirement so again developing those alternative products and and the the sort of business cases around for example um, you know the corporate ISAs or the alternative ways of saving and perhaps perhaps we can't engage people to necessarily lock the the money away till retirement particularly as I mentioned in the in the current political environment where there's, there's maybe uncertainty, but can we at least encourage them to be saving? Can we develop other products that mean that, that they are still focusing on, on the longer term future, um, but maybe giving them the comfort that they can still access some of those funds if they needed to in the meantime? So I think there's a, you know, an, a number of areas there where, where providers could perhaps be a little more creative and, and help put some products in place. And certainly, I think that the kind of workplace savings products yeah, have not taken off perhaps as much as they might do in the future. Because yeah. I do think that's potentially a very good way for employees to save, particularly if it can be managed through payroll deduction. You know, often when you talk to people, they say, oh, that's great because that money's gone into savings. Yeah. And I didn't have to think about it and I didn't have, you know, I, I never saw it in my bank account, so it wasn't mine to spend, you know, and it can be, you know, just from a behavioural finance yeah. point of view, a really great way Absolutely. to help people save. Absolutely. I think, you know, most, most employees want to save if they can, you know, they see that it's, that it's you know, a, a very valuable thing to be doing, but, but ultimately they have to prioritise between, the, you know, these, these different, different things. And um, so the more that we can... Again, coming back to flexibility and choice and how we can, we can support them to, to make the right decisions for them. And certainly in the survey, three quarters of employees said they wanted more support and guidance. So that was you know, from their employer, from their provider. And you know, a lot of the focus was on planning for a more comfortable retirement and you know, making sure that their money would last throughout retirement. So I think as people get older, that seems to be the main worry. Yeah, and that's what we've got in the world of pension freedoms. Very few are buying an annuity. So, you know, that's your pot of money. That's got to last you. And that seems to be a big worry. Absolutely. And, and we know that a lot of people underestimate potentially how long they might live in, in retirement. Um, so, so again, that's where the, the education piece comes in. <coughs> So I think that was probably what we wanted to talk about, Jake. I don't know, we've got a, a minute for questions. We've, we've had a few questions in. Maybe the, the one that's got the most votes, the most popular question, is, um, is about if you've got any advice about how you can create a safe space for people who are maybe in financial crisis, who are nervous about talking about money, um, did anything come out in the survey about how, empl how employers can, can act in that situation? It was interesting. The survey did say that, you know, and this does link back to the previous session, that most employees, so it's about 50%, talk to friends or family to cope with feelings of anxiety about their finances. So I, I'm not sure that we're doing particularly well at the moment in providing that safe space for people to talk about their finances. What I found is that 
you can hang around after you've done some presentations to people you know, about pensions or finance generically, and people will come up and talk to you afterwards. So I think it is often that one-on-one -on -one engagement where people are more willing to open up, but to expect someone to have their hand up in a session like this, I think you know, that, that's never gonna happen. So just making the time where you can talk one-on-one. -on -one. But Karen, I'm sure you've yeah. got views on that as well. No, I absolutely agree. I mean, realistically, people aren't going to want to, you know, appear that they've that they've got those sort of concerns. So, so if you can give them the 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 opportunity to to be able to have those more confidential conversations, or perhaps point them in, you know, a particular direction of where they might have support, then that's always going to be beneficial. Brilliant. Thank you.